Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matthew Halley. I'm a member of the engineering and marketing team here at Buckley Associates. Uh, before we start the webinar, I just want to say thank you to everybody participating today. We really appreciate your time. You're taking out of your day to learn with us. Uh, it means a lot to us here at Buckley um, as a lot of effort goes into planning these webinars. So we're really happy that you see the value and, and the services we're bringing to the engineering and contractor community here in the Northeast. So today I'm uh, joined by Chris Desick. He's actually the general manager of the noise control department at Price Industries. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about HVAC acoustics and really the primary purpose is to talk about the fundamentals and the background of uh, noise control really in, in HVAC. So this is a great introduction to the, and a thorough review of, of some of the concepts around sound. We find that a lot of engineers kind of forget about sound and and some don't know much about it and to be honest that's why we see so many acoustic uh consultants involved in so many jobs around the northeast recently especially um so today we're going to be uh talking about that and we have another session tomorrow but um for today uh you know if these are these are all topics that um the buckley engineering team is very familiar with so um and we we deal with these systems daily we actually have 10 mechanical engineers on staff to help you uh, on any of your designs. So if you do have any questions, um, feel free to uh, reach out to us after the webinar. But if you have any questions during the webinar, um, feel free to, to write those into the chat window and we and we can address those throughout the webinar. Um, and, uh, and that, yeah. So uh, this webinar is actually eligible for PDH credits. So if you do need those, please follow up with us after the webinar and we'll, give, we'll send you those. Um, so for now, we're going to get started. I'm going to hand this back over to Chris. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for putting this together, and thanks for attending. Go ahead, Chris. All right, good stuff, Matt. Appreciate the introduction. I'm just going to turn my webcam on here to introduce myself at the beginning. And uh, again, we appreciate your attendance in today's session. Uh, my name is Chris Desick. I'm the GM of Noise Control here at Price Industries. And a little bit of an introduction and background on myself. Um, I'm the GM at Price Industries under our noise control group. So primarily focused on HVAC acoustics and noise control products and methods on ways to mitigate sound and problems within commercial buildings. I've been with Price since 2007 and always in the noise control group, working in the design and engineering application groups, as well as product development on lab testing and development of different solutions around noise control problems. Um, today's session is really gonna be a good overview on HVAC acoustics as we call it. And it's something that we see commonly misunderstood. When we're talking of sound in general and acoustics, it's often forgotten about or sort of assumed it'll be okay. And this presentation is really gonna go through a lot of the details around HVAC acoustics and what you need to know to make sure that you're looking at things properly. We're also gonna review the concepts and different criteria that are used when referring to HVAC acoustics, different methods of rating and understanding the qualifications necessary, things like RC, NC, DBA. These are often misunderstood and we'll try and provide a really clear, concise synopsis on what these entail. And then finally, we're gonna go through a lot of the different features and benefits of noise control products such as silencers and acoustic panels, the different qualifying performance that these products can provide, as well as looking at a product known as a quiet terminal unit and why those can be very beneficial in this industry. The agenda for today's session is gonna include these five different sections, starting with the fundamentals of HVAC acoustics, going through all the different details and qualifications again for noise, we're gonna look at the design criteria, how we rate and qualify different performance metrics. We're gonna talk through silencers and acoustic panels, what they are, how they can be utilized. And we're gonna to briefly touch on acoustic analysis at the end of today's session. Tomorrow, there's another follow-up session to this one on acoustic analysis in general. We're gonna look a little bit more in detail on the concept of acoustic analysis, including a tool that can be leveraged and utilized for doing this in great detail. We also have some time at the end of today's session to answer any questions that may come up. Um, I also encourage you to ask questions throughout the session if something isn't clear or you want a, a clarification on something, you can use the chat function to submit those questions at any time. 
So without further ado, let's actually jump in here and begin with the fundamentals of HVAC acoustics. One of the first things I like to start with when talking about sound and noise control in general is really the importance of this topic. These are a few quotes that have come across over the years that really explain and show the importance of sound and acoustics in any sort of commercial building environment. The first is that patients complain about noise two times more often than anything else in a hospital, including the food. And this is something in healthcare and in uh, critical environment applications. Sound can be a big problem for people recovering and trying to rest and relax, as well as the doctors and workers within these facilities trying to be able to communicate and listen and work properly. And in healthcare, there's often a lot of hard surfaces, tile floors. Sound is able to be reverberated and reflected a lot more easier than some other applications. And that's primarily why sound transmission can cause a lot of disturbances. The second quote here is that guest reviews of over 5,000 hotels found that noise really gained more negative mentions than any other complaint. And in today's world with all the digital reviews and Yelp and Google reviews, people really hold the customer's experience highly in these type of environments. And when there's negative mentions and reviews to these type of facilities like multi-resident hotels or um, places that people go to, it can really affect their ability to draw in clients and perform their business. The final quote is that 91% of staff feel that noise negatively affects me in my daily working environment. And this is a bit of a generic statement across staff in a working environment, but in general, sound can be a very negative part of your environment. If you're working in a private office or in a factory, a warehouse, loud sound can distract and um, affect you negatively in the way that you can be able to perceive, hear, relax, and work efficiently. And it's something that really can cause great disturbances. When we talk of noise in the most simplest sense, we typically define it as really any unwanted or excessive sound. This could be something as simple as a hand dryer in a bathroom space or mechanical equipment, whether it's generators, pumps, fans, anything really producing loud, unwanted, excessive sound is typically classified as noise. When we speak of sound, we often refer to it as a pressure, a sound pressure. And pressure, sound pressure is something that can be seen and experienced that when it's transmitted through an atmospheric pressure, there's small fluctuations of sound pressure that happen. This obviously cannot be observed. It's happening in, in the air, in the area in which you're located. And these small fluctuations in the particulate matter create this transfer of sound energy across a media being the air in a lot of cases. And as the, the pressure fluctuation happens and sound transmission and travel experiences across a distance, this is how sound will move from a source to a receiver across a medium. When we refer to sound in general, there's two main ways that we often denote sound. And these ways are sound power and sound pressure. Sound power most commonly is denoted with an LW. And this is referring to the amount of sound energy that a source would have. One of the things to remember and understand is that sound power is often given to a source which is independent of the environment and it's measured in watts. So when you think of sound power, remember that terminology of independent of environment in that the sound power of a device or a piece of equipment really doesn't matter on where it's located. It's gonna be independent to that environment. Sound pressure on the other hand, denoted LP, is dependent on the environment and where it's located. Most people and persons within a space are gonna perceive and hear sound pressure, and it's very dependent on that space you're located. If you're in a large open arena or gymnasium, that sound pressure is gonna be perceived and heard differently than maybe in a small office environment. 
We often use sound pressure to refer to the design criteria of a space as well, the NC or the DBA of a space. And this is often how the receiver of that sound is gonna experience that total sound pressure. So something to keep in mind, LW, sound power, LP, sound pressure. One is independent, the other is dependent on the environment. This analogy is something that I've seen years ago and I find it to be quite informative to compare that of sound to that of heat from a fire. Similar to a fire burning, the power of that fire is gonna be very dependent on how large that fire is, how much wood or logs are burning will dictate the size or power of that fire. The intensity is changed as you move closer towards that fire. As you move away from it, the heat and the intensity are gonna lessen. The pressure from that heat of the fire could be seen as analogous to that of sound. Dependent on the environment, the further you are away, the closer you are, that pressure or the heat in this case would change quite drastically. Sound power and sound pressure could be seen as similar to this in that the larger the source of sound, the more powerful it is, the louder it's gonna be. As you move further away from it, the sound pressure is gonna change and lessen accordingly. That analogy I find to be quite helpful as sound can't be seen and felt as easily as that of heat from a fire, but it works well for this comparison. Another interesting thing with sound is that typically sound is referred to in different frequency ranges in terms of hertz. And this table here shows the hearing range of different types of animals in this case, in that different types of animals can hear different hearing ranges. Humans in general have a very wide range of hearing that starts on the low spectrum at around 20 hertz, up to the maximum of around 20,000 hertz. Most of the people attending today's session can't hear that extreme widest range as you age, as you attend rock concerts and sporting events, your hearing will lessen and your range of available hearing range will lessen with time typically. Human speech is a bit of a narrower range of sound spectrum and frequency range from about 125 to 8,000 hertz. And you can see that certain animals can hear extremely low or extremely high frequency ranges. Politicians at the bottom here, we weren't really sure if they hear anything, so we'll just leave them out of the conversation for today. When we're looking at frequency ranges and low frequency versus high frequency, low frequency we typically denote as something like a 63 or 125 hertz frequency range. When we refer to that frequency, we often also look at the wavelength of that frequency. The wavelength is a relatively simple formula in that it's the speed of sound over the frequency. The lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. And what you'll see here is that for something like 250 Hertz, the wavelength of that frequency would actually be a nine foot wavelength, a very long swooping gradual wavelength. As the frequency range increases and you move up to a higher frequency range, something like an 8,000 Hertz, for example, the wavelength now is very short. It's 1.7 inches in this case here. And what that means is that low frequency sounds travel with long wavelengths and high frequency sounds travel with a very short wavelength. And it's something that's important to understand when looking at things like noise control. In general, lower frequency sounds are harder to mitigate, harder to block, harder to attenuate. Higher frequency sounds being very short wavelengths are often easier to deal with, easier to attenuate. Again, looking at the spectrum of sound, low frequency often denoted as a rumble type noise in that low 63, even 31 and a half Hertz octobands. Neutral sounding spectrum would be in that 125 to about 500 Hertz, and a high frequency sound would be in that 1000 Hertz and above, typically sounding like a hiss type noise, something that could be distracting or disturbing depending on the environment. When we look at HVAC system components, this graph shows a nice 
categorization of different common products. Typically, in the higher frequency spectrums, you have things like diffusers and dampers that are going to have a higher velocity of air and a higher sound spectrum associated with them, creating that hiss type noise. As you move down in the sound spectrum to things like chillers and, and air moving devices like terminal units and even fans and pumps, you can see that that sound spectrum is drastically different than that of a diffuser, the low frequency rumble type noise I mentioned earlier. And this is something that's good to know and understand as if you're dealing with a sound issue and say you walk into a space and you hear a hiss noise, you can categorize and often diagnose what it may be caused by a little easier by narrowing and understanding that frequency range or even just listening to it to understand what may be problematic in that scenario. We often also use the decibel scale to refer to sound and sound spectrum. On the low end of the decibel scale, there's things like whispering and quiet occupied spaces when you're talking of 10, 20, 30 decibels. And as you move into more practical environments like um, commercial buildings and offices and residential areas, and even louder into maybe exposure to music or industrial type noise, um, the sound spectrum varies quite drastically from low to high decibel ranges. In general, humans are quite sensitive to loud sound sources. And if you're exposed to a large amount of sound or a high decibel range for a long period of time, it's highly recommended that you wear hearing protection. Anywhere over about 75, 80 decibels, hearing protection is greatly recommended to prevent any sort of long-term hearing loss to the individual exposed to that area. We often use decibels to refer to sources as well, in that if you have a piece of mechanical equipment, there'll be a decibel amount categorized or qualified for that unit. In general, something like 90 dB could be used to refer to that of a fan. If you have multiple fans, you can often have multiple sound sources with different criteria or ratings associated with them. In this case, two fans, both at 90 decibels. If you were going to have these operating in the same general area or in series with each other, what would the total be of the addition of these two? 90 plus 90 in this case would often obviously yield 180, right? Very, very loud. Well, thankfully, that's not the case in that decibels are actually added logarithmically in that when you have two sound sources added together that are identical, 90 plus 90, it would actually yield 93 decibels. If you push this a bit further along and go 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 90, this would actually yield 96 decibels due to the logarithmic addition scale. To break it down a little bit further, again, 90 plus 90 is 93, and then 93 plus 93 would yield that 96. What's happening here is that you're taking a base 10 log addition of those individual sound sources or the, the, the noise level of those sources. It's a relatively simple calculation that you can do if you have multiple sound sources added together. Something like this here, showing the mathematics behind it, that 10 times the base 10 log of 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 90 would actually yield 96 decibels. And this is something that's often misconstrued or maybe not fully understood, but it's something that can be used for taking a general calculation of multiple sound sources operating in close proximity to each other. This graphical representation is actually handy to look at when you're adding two sound sources together that may or may not be identical. If you look at the, the axis of the graph, on the bottom axis, we're showing the difference between two sound sources. And on the vertical graph, we're looking at the resulting sound level addition. So what this is, is that if we look at that 90 plus 90 example again, you're going to have zero difference between those two sources which would yield a three decibel addition to the higher of the two in this case. So again, just to explain 90 plus 90 would yield 93. If we did something like this and say there was a four decibel difference between two sources, this would actually now yield a one and a half decibel addition to the higher of the two. 
for example, E plus 76, if you had a four decibel difference, in this case, 76 is four less than 80, you would actually add 1.5 decibels to that higher of the two, which would be 80, yielding 81.5. As you move further away between sound sources, up to around 10 decibels between the two, what you'll see is that the addition that is added, the resulting sound level addition, is quite minimal. Having something like 80 added to 70 decibels, it actually yields an 80.4 decibel addition, a minor increase from that 80 decibel higher of the two sources. And as you get even further away, 10, 15, 20 decibels apart, the difference between the two almost becomes negligible. It's not going to be something that people could hear or perceive the difference between, in this case, say 80 and 60 decibels. 80 is going to greatly overpower the sound energy from the 60. This table sort of shows a general um, perception of hearing between sound level changes. In general, most humans cannot tell the difference between a one decibel change of sound energy. 79 compared to 80 is not gonna be something that most individuals could be able to pinpoint or notice. A three decibel change is typically just at that level of perceptibility. When you have 87 versus 90, people will most likely be able to tell it's just slightly louder at that three decibel higher change. What's interesting with the logarithmic scale is that it changes quite drastically as you get to a larger sound level change, such as a 10, 10 decibel level change is seen or heard as twice as loud, whereas 20 decibels could be four times as loud or 30 decibels even eight times as loud. And again, it has to do with the logarithmic scale of sound and how a larger difference would yield a much higher perceived change. Oppositely, a 10 decibel reduction in sound could be seen as half as loud rather than twice as loud. So if you can reduce something in sound from 80 to 70, this would be a drastic attenuation perceived or heard in that case. So I hope that gives you guys a good uh, basis of fundamentals of sound, talking through some of the basic understanding of sound pressure, sound power, and some of the different criteria on decibels and, and frequency ranges. Let's now turn into our design criteria conversation and look a little bit closer at how we refer to sound. One of the best ways to look at criteria and understanding how we can refer to the background sound in a space is this table shown here. This is actually a table reference from ASHRAE's Applications Handbook and a really good reference for understanding HVAC-related background sound within spaces. The way the table works is that if you look on the left side, there's various types of rooms defined, and even more so defining the, how that space may be used. And then on the right side of the table, it shows corresponding recommended criteria that could be used to refer to that background sound. And what I mean by that is if I look at something like an office building and a conference room in that office building, ASHRAE recommends NC30 for that space would be a recommended background sound level that would be desirable for that space. Different types of spaces will have different criteria associated with them, depending on how they're being used, depending on how they're constructed, could affect and change the way that space is gonna sound and be perceived these type of criteria are really easy ways that we can refer to the background sound within a space. And follow with me here as I go through this. I don't want to lose you in the details, but the way these are calculated and created are effectively taking the sound pressure within a space and graphically representing it to yield a single number reference. And what I mean by that is that this table at the top here is showing, again, frequency in terms of octave band and the corresponding LP or sound pressure as we learned earlier. And if I look at this and I have eight different sound pressures and different frequencies, if somebody came to you and said, 
you know, the sound pressure in my office is 49 dB at 63 hertz and 42 at 125 and 40 at 250 and 37 and 500 and so on. It's a little bit hard to comprehend and maybe perceive what that means. It's a lot easier to say my office is NC39. And why that is, is that the way that you can yield and calculate these single number criteria is that you take the individual octaband sound pressure ratings and you actually plot them on a graph in this case. The NC graph is taking um, the individual sound pressures across a standardized list of curves and the highest curve that's crossed on that chart would yield your NC criteria, in this case NC39. It's a little bit hard to see the actual numbers and the curvature of these graphs, but I'll show it clear in the next couple slides here. And that's really what these are. NC, RC, and DBA are weightings and criterias of different ways that you can refer to the background sound within a space. Taking the sound pressure in a space and plotting it against a series of graphs or weightings to understand what that space will sound like. A very handy reference to use for this purpose. NC, or known as noise criteria, is one of the most commonly used in HVAC as a manufacturer and in general for ASHRAE looking at guidelines and criteria. NC is a really nice way to refer to the background sound in the space. It was developed in the late 1950s, and really it's a way that you can categorize and qualify eight different octobands with a single number. You'll often see this for a rating as well for things like terminal units and diffusers, and referring to the background space using NC is a very common, easy way to get an understanding of what that space will sound like, if it's acceptable or not, if it's going to sound appropriate for the desirable usage. One thing to note is that NC is a little bit limiting in that it only gives you that number, NC39, NC35 in this case, as shown on this graph. It doesn't really give you any characteristic of the sound. If it's low frequency dominant or high frequency dominant, or if there's a tone or a pitch, you won't know that by the NC. It's just a single number reference, so it is a little bit limiting. Another criteria that's a bit newer, developed in the early 1980s, is room criteria, or RC. And this criteria type gives you a little bit more insight to the spectrum of sound, the characteristics of the sound, due to the fact that you're taking the average of three different octobands and plotting it against a series of curves again, in this case, constant slope curves, your RC criteria is actually going to yield some insight into where the spectrum of sound is predominantly held. In this case, if it's a rumble or a hiss or a neutral, you're going to get that indicator as part of the RC criteria. Typically, this is given as uh, in brackets behind the number. So in this case, it might be RC42 with a bracket H behind it, denoting that it would be in that hiss or high frequency spectrum, as we learned earlier, above 1000 hertz. Another criteria that we commonly use for referring to sound and giving different weightings is a DBA or a DBC. DBA is a lot more common than DBC. DBC is really only used for um, some louder types of sources or peak sounds or measuring uh, peak frequencies and explosions or loud um, areas of sound. DBA is something that's commonly used, though, that provides a weighting and discriminates against the low frequencies, similar to how the frequency response to the human ear hears. And DBA is something you'll commonly see with respect to the way equipment is cataloged or specified in terms of it's similar to the way the human ear would actually perceive and hear that sound. DBA, showing a bit more detail, is uh, shown here where there's actually a correction given to the sound power of that device or source that deducts a lot of that low frequency sound to weight it more accordingly to how humans will hear. Um, there was a question about will the presentation be available and by all means we can send out copies and a PDF version of this so that if you ever want these slides to refer back to the weightings, the criteria, 
you'll have that at your disposal. Another criteria that we use quite frequently in, in HVAC as well as in noise control is a criteria known as STC, sound transmission class. And this is something again that's often misunderstood or misinterpreted or even specified. And in its simplest sense, the STC level refers to the transmission loss of a specific material or device. And what I mean by that is that a sound transmission class would be the qualifying metric of how well a product blocks sound from transmitting through it. You'll often see STC levels given to things like wall construction, windows, doors, even ceiling tiles and things like that, but also noise control products like acoustic enclosures or barriers or panels can have an STC criteria associated with them. Wall constructions will often have different STC criteria depending on their effectiveness of blocking sound. Typically, the higher the STC value, the more sound transmission a product would have. In this case here, as there's more layers and thickness and mass of a wall system, the higher the STC value. The higher the STC, the more trans transmission loss would be present. NRC is another criteria that's often used to refer to a product's ability to absorb sound. And this is a, a good way to look at the difference between blocking versus absorbing sound energy. STC, transmission loss, blocking sound transfer. NRC, sound absorption, a product's ability to absorb sound energy. NRC is something that's tested and usually given to products that are acoustically absorptive different types of fabric and medias, uh, fiberglass or mineral wool, again, ceiling tiles, carpet, things like that would have a qualifying NRC criteria associated with them. This is calculated and measured based on a product's ability to absorb sound or have absorption in four different octave bands, and the average of those octave bands sound absorption would yield that NRC value. Typically, when you're reviewing and referring to NRC, this is going to be a coefficient between 0 and 1 in terms of 1 being perfectly absorptive and 0 being perfectly reflective. The more absorptive a product would be, a material would be, the more sound it would absorb. And things like a commercial building ceiling tile, for example, whether they're fiberglass or pressed mineral wool, will often have a noise reduction coefficient like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, yielding how effective it is at absorbing sound. The next section I wanted to review with you guys is on some of the noise control products and ways that you can mitigate sound and comparing them for an understanding on the way these products can be applied to mitigate sound in traditional HVAC systems. This first table here shows a bit of a comparison between a 24 inch by 24 inch duct that would have a variety of different sound absorption or sound mitigation um, techniques. And I'll walk through this here with you to, to give you an understanding of what you're looking at. So the path as shown on the left side of this table is referring to what device is being used to yield the corresponding insertion loss as shown on the right side of the table in the different octobands. When we refer to insertion loss, we're often referring to the amount of sound energy that is removed from a system by inserting a device into that system. In this case, looking at something like a 10 foot long piece of ductwork, there's different ways that sound can be mitigated by using that piece of ductwork. In an unlined bare sheet metal duct, you can see that there's very little what we call insertion loss. Sound really doesn't get absorbed into sheet metal at all. Uh, most of that sound energy is gonna transmit and uh, transmit directly through that device. In this case, 10 foot long sheet metal duct. There's a little bit of sound that would break out of that ductwork depending on the gauge and the thickness of that material. But in general, almost negligible in terms of insertion loss 
of having a piece of duct without any liner. As you add a liner, such as a one inch or a two inch duct liner, um, typically this would be something like a fiberglass liner or a dual density material, an acoustic liner, you can see that you can get considerable amounts of insertion loss, specifically in the higher frequency ranges. In the low frequency, 63, 125, and so on, you don't really see much of a benefit from having a thin acoustic liner on a sheet metal duct. This goes back to some of the earlier fundamentals we talked about. Sound is a wave. Low frequency sound is a very long wavelength. Sound energy in low frequency typically won't be absorbed in something like a thin two inch duct liner but it will be in the high frequency ranges where that wavelength is much shorter. And you can see that in the values here. At the bottom of the table, we're comparing to a three foot silencer or a five foot silencer and the equivalent insertion loss that you could achieve by inserting a device like that. Silencers are one type of noise control product that can be utilized for mitigating sound within a duct system. And in this case here, a three foot long or 36 inch long silencer could yield considerable benefit in this system. You can see it gives some broadband insertion loss performance across the different octave bands and increasing the length of that silencer, an additional two feet would give you even further insertion loss performance, which could be a very good thing if you're trying to attenuate sound within a duct system. Silencers in general are typically tested for what we call dynamic insertion loss. And the testing standard is something that's important to sort of understand in that noise control products are tested for a variety of different types of performance. They're typically tested to an ASTM E477 standard, and that test standard tests for dynamic insertion loss, generated noise, as well as pressure drop. And I'll speak a little bit more to how this testing is done. In general, the test setup for silencers looks something like this, where there's a sound source, the connecting ductwork, and then finally a reverberant sound room. The way the test is done is that sound energy is created and transmitted through that ductwork by a speaker system that would be producing that sound energy. As it's transmitted through the ductwork, air is also transmitted along with it and measured in that reverberant sound chamber under certain conditions. Typically a silencer is then inserted into that duct system and the test is rerun under the same conditions and airflow and sizing as the unducted or sorry, unsilenced scenario. The difference between the silenced measurement and the unsilenced measurement is how insertion loss is typically measured and cataloged in that this specific silencer in these specific proportions would yield a specific amount of insertion loss based on the width, the height, the length, the airflow, and so on. And that's how that ASTM E477 standard is performed. That's how it's measured for sound performance. Silencers in general come in a wide variety of options and different configurations. And this slide shows four different categories of silencers. Typically, a silencer looks something like this here, where there's baffles and acoustic material within them. And there's different types of baffles, different types of media, depending on what's necessary for the application. In labs and in hospitals and in critical environments, you may have to use something called a packless silencer. But in other applications, a traditional absorptive silencer is the most practical, appropriate usage for that space. There's also many different types of air transfer silencers where you need to transfer air, but not the noise between spaces. Acoustic panels are another type of product that work very well for mitigating sound transfer. They provide, again, STC or NRC, which you guys are well familiar with based on the earlier information I provided, transmission loss or sound absorption, depending on what's needed. Another device that can be used for mitigating sound are acoustic louvers. And these are an interesting product that works very well for providing 
again, insertion loss as well as transmission loss for mitigating sound transfer in or out of a space. Acoustic louvers are a product that provide an attractive way to ventilate a mechanical space, but having, having that added benefit of acoustic material within the blades or the baffles themselves so that it will be absorbed or blocked before transferring directly maybe into the environment. Another product I wanted to touch on is something called a quiet terminal unit. And this is something that we at Price here have spent a great deal of time and effort on developing a solution to a very common problem. When we look at a terminal unit or a single duct sort of box, um, the sound that gets produced from these units can be problematic in certain applications. And what is often done is that either a silencer as shown on the left side or an attenuator can be utilized to help mitigate and attenuate that discharge sound from these devices. In general, when we call something a silencer, we use this terminology silencer to refer to a product that has baffles and perforated metal to mitigate and attenuate the sound that's passing through it. An attenuator is typically more of a line duct device that would also attenuate sound, but as we showed earlier, may be limiting in its broad attenuation properties specifically in the higher frequencies it will work well but may not work so well in the low frequency areas. What's been done is that work and development on developing a quiet terminal unit that leverages a sound um, attenuator or silencer can be leveraged to provide a very quiet ear moving device in that the sound that's discharged from these units can be mitigated through the integrated assembly of this device. What I mean by that is that terminal units are typically tested to a standard ASHRAE 130. Silencers are typically tested to a different standard, the ASTM E477, as I showed earlier. What happens is that if there's two different devices tested to two different standards and potentially from two different manufacturers, the performance that's yielded by doing this could be unpredictable. And through testing and through development, what we've seen is that silencers perform very well to that ASTM standard, but when close coupled with a terminal unit improperly, the performance of that unit can be lessened. And this graph here shows the insertion loss compared to the distance between the ASTM standard of the silencer being tested standalone without an air moving device in front of it. And as you move closer to it, how the performance of that silencer degrades and lessens due to the inlet conditions and flow characteristics of that combination of the two devices. And as we started researching and developing this, this is something that was quite enlightening to us to find in that we wanted these products to perform ideally under conditions that they would be seen in that this length between the two devices would be minimized and we would expect the insertion loss to be high to provide a very quiet air moving device. And through this research, what we decided to do and what is often done in these quiet terminal units is that Rather than testing the silencer to the ASTM standard, combine it with the terminal unit and test it and even rate it to the AHRI 880 standard and test it to ASHRAE 130 as a combined assembly, terminal unit, silencer, combined assembly that is tested and rated accordingly. The good thing with doing this is that the performance can be optimized in that the damper positioning of the terminal unit, the baffle geometry of the silencer are tested as an assembly so that overall it works as expected. There's no more unpredictability in doing this. And you really get three main benefits by doing that. Improved inlet conditions in that the silencer's inlet is optimized to match the damper sizing and positioning of the terminal unit. The silencer is 
sized appropriately to match again the geometry and the overall pressure drop of the system is minimized by knowing exactly what the conditions through it are going to be and we've done this on many products that we've developed to really optimize the overall performance and geometry and science behind how these operate and how you can develop a very quiet air moving device that is tested and rated as an assembly to meet the qualifying performance metrics. The last section I wanted to touch on today is sort of a precursor to the following session on acoustic analysis and silencer selection, and it has to do with acoustic analysis. Acoustic analysis is sort of a concept and a topic that we see a lot in the HVAC industry. And what it is, is essentially that there's many different types of acoustic environments that are present in commercial buildings. This slide shows six examples of different types of acoustic environment, healthcare and hospital operating room spaces, teaching and classroom spaces, uh, rest and recovery spaces, private and um, boardroom type spaces, as well as theatrical in entertainment type spaces. And all of the different types of environments will differ depending again on the desired usage as well as the materials that are present. Some may have a higher range of acceptability from an NC standpoint or a DBA standpoint. Others may have very strict qualifying metrics and criteria that need to be met. There's also many different types of outdoor acoustic environments I don't show here, but often there's bylaws or legislation around what may be deemed acceptable at a property line or at an outdoor area at certain times of the day or night that needs to be met. We look at these different types of environments and criteria and we sort of refer to them as either dead or live depending on their materials and goals from an acoustic standpoint. And what we do with this information is at the design stages, we can often work together to understand what's necessary to meet the design goal. And the basics of acoustic analysis and the topic of this acoustic analysis really break a problem down into these three elements, the source, the path, and the receiver. And when you look at really any sort of application and break it down into these elements, you can understand how a space will sound, how it will sound, or what is necessary to get down to a desirable goal at the design stage. And what I mean by that is that there's different things within this analysis that need to be considered. The source of noise is typically the sound power, as we learned earlier, that LW. The source of noise is often from some sort of air moving device or sound creating mechanical product, whether it's an air handler, a fan, a chiller, a terminal unit, a generator, um, there's something that's gonna be creating sound and that's the primary source of our analysis. There's then a path that that sound is gonna transmit through or across to get down to the final receiver. And there's a lot of different characteristics and configurations of looking at this analysis, but it's something that can be done really in any application at the design stage to ensure that your criteria are met. Many different types of paths, again, supply, return, radiated paths, depending on how the sound will transmit from that source to the receiver. Looking at the path of sound in general is something like this here, that if you have a sound source, path is gonna transmit or sound is gonna transmit through different paths, depending on what you're most concerned with, whether it's a radiated path down into an occupied area, a ductborne path such as the supply air on a fan or an air handler, or the return path that may be vented or ducted back into that air moving device. When we look at acoustic analysis, and again, the session tomorrow, Mauricio Salinas is gonna be presenting, is gonna get more in detail on how this can be done and how 
we can help with this in any sort of application. Typically what's done in a traditional acoustic analysis is that the sound power, as well as the different elements that are necessary in the path are tabulated and calculated to yield a summation. In this table here, if you look at our example analysis, what we're doing is that we're taking an air handler unit's inlet sound power, LW, and the individual octobands of that sound power. That would be this blue air handler's sound energy that would be rated and cataloged from its manufacturer. From that information, you typically deduct the path elements to get down to the summation of what we'd estimate the sound level in that space to be. And we can do this really for any type of sound path, whether it's indoor, outdoor, um, very simplistic or very complex. You can model acoustically what a sound path would look like and what we would estimate the summation of sound pressure in a space to be. Once we've done that, it's quite useful to understand if this is deemed either acceptable or not based on how that space is going to be used. In this case, if we took that estimated sound pressure level and we plotted it on an NC chart, as we learned earlier, what you would do is you would check to see if that estimated sound level meets the criteria or not and determine how much insertion loss may be necessary in this case to get down to a desirable level. So in this case, the blue dots on the graph that we've plotted would be our estimated sound level. And the vertical orange bar here is how much sound needs to be reduced to get down to that NC40 curve. What we call that is insertion loss in that you would require this much insertion loss to get down to that NC40 criteria. I went through this pretty quickly in terms of how you set up and analyze and look at the data behind an acoustic analysis, but we have an entire webinar on this um, scheduled for tomorrow on how this can be done and using the price acoustic analysis tool to be able to do it very easy and accurately. When we look at acoustic analysis in general and sound transmission, it's something that can be done in a variety of different manners. Typically, as sound is transmitted through a path, it'll transmit in a simplest sense straightforward through the duct that's present. But there's alternate paths that may be forgotten or misunderstood or maybe um, missed entirely, such as the breakout noise path. When applying noise control products like sound attenuators or silencers, this is one way that you can help mitigate that. And the acoustic analysis can be done early in the stages to really understand how the location and placement of a noise control product can help meet the design goals or potentially still yield problematic areas such as this here, that if a silencer is installed in the incorrect area or maybe um, breakout noise could become more of a concern, this is something that you can use that tool for understanding what the product needs to be and where its placement may yield best performing metrics within that system. Um, I just wanted to introduce the topic of acoustic analysis today in this session. And as I mentioned, tomorrow we're gonna get a little bit more in detail on what this entails and how it can be done using the price acoustic analysis software. We do have a software tool as I'm introducing here. Um, that's a very powerful modeling tool that engineers and consultants can use for their primary basis of doing this type of work. If you have a sound source and you wanna understand what it's gonna sound like in an occupied space, this tool can be used for that exact purpose. And it's really used for noise modeling, prediction, um, creating schedules, specifications, analysis reports for that primary intention. The tool is contained within the all-in-one for engineers software. And again, we're gonna to touch more in detail on it tomorrow. I just wanted to provide some general insight into what it is and how it can be utilized for this purpose. 
I did want to thank everyone again for to attending today's Fundamentals of Sound workshop, um, primarily on HVAC acoustics. I really hope you found this useful, whether it's a refresher of stuff you may be already familiar with, or maybe new material for others on uh, the criteria, sound pressure, sound power, some of the fundamentals. And uh, I really hope you found this useful. If there's any questions, I really welcome you guys to submit them to us, whether it's in the chat at this point, or uh, following the session, please reach out to myself or the Buckley team. We'd be happy to really converse more on this in any, uh, in any fashion or expand further on anything that may be of interest. That sort of concludes today's webinar. Um, Matt, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything else on your end, but again, I appreciate you guys attending today's session. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Chris. Um, Mauricio, I'm not sure if you were able to get to some of these questions here um, or if maybe, uh, Chris, did you answer these? Do you see the question bar here? Yeah, I thought I, I thought I answered them, Matt, uh, it, but I don't know if they went through. It, show, it shows here that I did, but maybe double check. If not, I can resend them. Okay. Um, it doesn't show the answers here. Maybe you sent them directly to them. Um, which would be fine, I guess. I, yeah, I, I hit send to all, but um, for okay. some reason, maybe, maybe it didn't. All right, well, that's fine. Um, I think that maybe they were answered. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, we'll conclude it for now. And you know what? If anybody has any questions, um, feel free to reach out to us in the follow-up. Uh, you can always reach out to either Sherry, who invited you, or um, uh, whoever sends the follow-up. I believe that will be Dean. Um, in in the uh, in in an email, so um, we can always point you in the right direction to your Buckley point of contact. So um, again, thank you, Chris, for all the information today. Great job. Thank you, everybody, for putting this together, and uh, we appreciate your your time today. So if you have any questions, again, send them to Sherry or my or, or the follow up. And um, if you have any, uh, if you'd like PDH credits, please reach out and let us know if you'd like those as well. And again, thanks for everybody uh, for attending today. And that's it. Good stuff, guys. Thank you again. Have a great day. See you.